uh, uh, the thought occurred to me that, you know, if you live long enough, you'll either be canonized or be found out. <laughs> uh, worse still, you can be canonized and found out afterwards. <laughs> uh, I hope, I hope I escape that fate at any rate. <laughs> T.K. Ken Whitaker, something of a paradox. Greatest living Irishman, yet to many, largely unknown. But then, historical greatness depends not on fame, but on impact. But for the man in the street, it's a problem of how does it affect him and his future progress, his family's progress. And Whitaker had impact. He was arguably the most accomplished civil servant in Ireland in the 20th century. Secretary of the Department of Finance at 40. He introduced modern Keynesian economics to Ireland, was a key negotiator of Ireland's accession to the European Union. I, as governor of the central bank, have been emphasizing that other part. Influential with Sean Lamass and Jack Lynch on Northern Ireland policy, his analysis and prescription, written 30 years before, anticipates the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. ...having a depressing influence on our economy at present. I left at 60. And in fact, a new life opened up. And in retirement, Ken Whitaker was indefatigable in his contribution to public life, involved in constitutional review, prison reform, the Irish language, and one time Chancellor of the National University of Ireland. Jack Lynch should become a senator. I don't think there is any other official, remotely comparable impact upon um, Irish history in the second half of the 20th century. I mean, politicians, De Valera, Fitzgerald, the church, I suppose, McQuaid. Uh, but for the rest, the man who really changed things was Ken Whitaker. He was one of these people, and they're rare enough really, who made a dramatic difference. Partly, I think, by what he achieved through economic development, partly by being himself. One of the things that struck me when I became secretary was that I had a model of Whitaker in my mind. And I thought when I was faced with difficult decisions, particularly big matters about the national interest and so on, relations with ministers, I tended to ask myself, what would Whittaker do in these circumstances? A sense of duty, I suppose, a sense of patriotism, a sense of, perhaps like the parable of the talents, that he's a, he's a man with talents and gifts and that he's going to use them. If you take the government to mean the whole corporate finance department, the thesis to all of them. And, and, and you know, I felt he, he had an enormous influence in it. He was a man of the highest intellectual and, and moral quality, a man of great integrity. And I, I find it fascinating that he was a judge to be recently the greatest living Irishman. First of all, we were probably the first generation to inherit, as it were, an independent state. We didn't have to take any part in founding it. We weren't out with our rifles and so on. I'm a 1916 man only because I was born in 1916. Ken Whitaker was born in Ross Trevor, County Down. His father worked in the local small linen mill, but found that in the years after World War I, the future of the Ross Trevor mill was not too secure. Ken was six years of age, the family moved to Drogheda. It was 1922 and his father took up a new position in the thriving Greenmount and Boyne linen mill, one of the larger industries in the town. Ken Whitaker was always appreciative of the education he got at St. Joseph's in King Street from the Christian Brothers. Happy memories. Wonderful teachers in secondary school. I owe an enormous debt to them. And a late teacher, Padre McCann, who taught history and Irish, and came in half an hour before school time for no reward whatever to teach a handful of us French. And French wasn't on the curriculum. And that has enriched my life immensely. He was a distinguished pupil. In the 1932 intercert exam, he won fourth place in Ireland and won himself a cash scholarship. I remember being very gratified to be able to buy my first bicycle. 
To buy a bicycle in Drogheda is really an absolute necessity. You couldn't choose a better place in Ireland to be young and venturesome because it's a medieval town and it has the whole Boyne Valley just in its background. As a schoolboy, he was active in the town's social and community life. An early introduction to the lower slopes of finance and accounting came through his involvement with the Penny Bank Savings Scheme, run by the Augustinians in Drogheda. Well, that was excruciating torment, because after getting in all the money on the Friday night, you had to balance the books. If there was a penny or tuppence out, we had to go back through everything. And I would say, look, for God's sake, I'll give you the penny. Thought, oh, no, that's not. The books must be right. In the leaving certificate of 1934, Ken Whitaker again distinguished himself. He thought he might study medicine at UCD. Meanwhile, he had also sat the entrance exam for the civil service. And then my father was just about to retire, and it suddenly came to dawn on us all that what were the prospects of being able to finance a six-year university course when he had only a small pension. At that same moment, the postman dropped a letter in my letterbox saying that I had got first place in the clerical officer's examination, so very quickly it was decided that the bird in the hand ought to be taken. So in 1934 he became a civil servant as a clerical officer in the Department of Education. So for the extra few shillings a week I travelled second class, which gave me a chance of reading and studying on the way up and back. But one thing it taught me, which I am imbued with to this day, punctuality. If you missed the 20 past 8 train from Drogheda to Dublin, you were late about an hour and a big red cross was put against your name on the roll book and you were, maybe your increment was stopped. In the mid-30s, there were the first publications of penguins and pelicans and um, these books contained a good deal of economics and especially a good deal of socialism. So I became a rabid, well, not quite rabid, <laughs> socialist. And um, when I first got a vote, voted for the Labour Party in the mistaken belief that they were a socialist party. The year after he joined the civil service, Ken Whitaker took the exam for executive officer. He got first place. His early ambition is manifest in his rise through the civil service. 1937, first place in exam for assistant inspector of taxes. 1938, first place in exam for administrative officer. And that same year, he joined the elite, Department of Finance. In fact, it was a great release to get to finance from other departments. You felt you were entering somewhere where everyone was an officer, everyone carried a marshal's baton in his briefcase. And the youngest AO, administrative officer, could talk to the general, the secretary of the department. McElligot, was wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Not that you would do it very often, <laughs> because uh, he was treated with considerable awe and respect. But I eventually was able to push past that barrier and establish very good personal relations with him by just being a bit bold. J.J. McElligot was of the old school, and his cast of mind was that of an accountant, not an economist. He was at his most content when he was turning down proposals from the spending departments. Balanced budgets with minimal public expenditure was his ideal. Such thinking was the hallmark of the Department of Finance. Whittaker's relationship with McGilligot was interesting. McGilligot was his patron. Whittaker was recognised at a very early point as being exceptionally able, having, having an exceptionally incisive mind. And uh, McGilligot was important, obviously, in ensuring that Whitaker got promotions to early on out of turn. The department had steered the Irish economy through the difficult early years after independence, through the Civil War, the International Depression, a trade war with Britain, and had then settled for frugal comfort during World War II, known in Ireland as the Emergency. In the course of his speech, Mr. De Valero said it was vital for everybody to put themselves in a position to face whatever troubles might confront them. There had been a widespread, naive belief that once independence was achieved, prosperity would follow. 
Whitaker, now a student of economics, appreciated that the dynamics of a 20th century economy were more complex. Whitaker first came to prominence when McGilligan made him sort of personal advisor to Frank Aiken as Minister for Finance in 1945. Aiken came in with his own very unusual and idiosyncratic ideas on, on, on policy, financial policy, uh, social credit policies, but these were anathema to the department. And McGilligan asked Whitaker to keep in contact with the minister almost on a daily basis. Oh, yes, Minister, that's a very interesting idea. And then you would be sitting there, and then you'd say, but I, I wonder what would we do if such and such and such and such. And then, and, and also such and such and such and such. And then he would say, oh, well, uh, I, I think about it further. <laughs> they became quite close. And of course, this gave um, Whitaker access to a minister, which for an assistant principal at the age of 28, was pretty well unprecedented. The Statistical and Social Inquiry Society of Ireland has been meeting since 1847, since the famine. Since then, every major shift in Irish history has been debated by its members, by economists, public servants and the intelligentsia. New theories have been debated, heresies mooted. And in the 1940s and 1950s, Ken Whitaker was among the heretics. Whitaker's main heresy was that he was impressed by the new economic guru, John Maynard Keynes, who was to prove to be the most influential economist of the century. McGilligan detested Keynes, once stating that he belonged to the escapist school of economists. Keynes argued that unemployment could best be tackled through government intervention in the economy, if necessary, by public works. There were now two schools of thought in finance, the old guard who believed the government should stay out of the economy and the young Keynesians who believed in state intervention. In the heart of one of the world's richest pasture lands, The Irish economy in the post-war period remained stagnant, too dependent on agriculture and on the British market, and with any inefficiencies in native industries unexposed, sheltered by tariff barriers. The old policy of national self-sufficiency was not delivering jobs. While post-war European countries were achieving growth rates of 4%, Ireland was barely managing 1%, and the outlook remained poor. The problems were clear to Ken Whitaker, and becoming clearer as he studied for a master's degree in economics at London University by correspondence. I have a distinct recollection of pushing a pram containing a wailing baby, the first child, up and down with one hand while I was trying to write an essay in the correspondence course with the other. Yet few of them there are on the outside who would care to trade places with Ireland's farmers. Over the period of the 50s, a quarter of a million people emigrated. That had an extraordinarily depressing effect then. There was a feeling that, and the phrase at the time was, I remember contemporaries of mine saying it, this country is finished. Get out and emigrate somewhere. The 1950s was a time of pessimism. The census revealed that the population had dipped below 3 million. And if the downward trend continued, some predicted that Ireland's population would be less than 2 million by the end of the 20th century. There tends to be a collapse of confidence, even among the political elites, among the politicians, civil servants, the hierarchy. People are beginning seriously to question, well, what was the point of independence? And there is a sort of crashing around no real defined sense of direction. And I think that's what Ken Whitaker does. That, that is why I think he's so important. That he provides, if you like, a road map. Just trying to lift ourselves by our own bootstraps was not going to get anywhere, obviously, in a country that was poor and had a very small market. And the only way you could promote employment and living standards was by gearing yourself to sell your produce abroad in and since agricultural produce could only be sold in the British market at low prices dictated by their food policy you had to try and get into other things industry and services this as you see yeah. is the band minutes of the statistical and social inquiry society 1949 to 1973 on may the 27th 1956 
Whitaker presented a paper to the Statistical and Social Inquiry Society of Ireland. The paper was called Capital Formation, Saving and Economic Progress. He hinted in this paper that there should be scope for some leadership role for the public servant. Three days later, in a surprise promotion, bypassing more senior colleagues, Whitaker was made secretary of the Department of Finance. Yes, I do remember it very distinctly because I was in with the, the Minister for Finance at that time, Gerard Sweetman, and he said to me, what way would it be taken in the Department of Finance if Whittaker was secretary? And I said, well, there's two schools of thought. The younger people would probably be very interested in, uh, you know, you'll inflame their ambitions. Uh, the older people will have a great deal of sympathy for Sarsfield Hogan. But he did promote Whittaker, and it was very, very newsworthy in the Department of Finance and outside. I can remember the mood very well because I have, in fact, a diary entry for that day. It was May the 29th, this is 1956, a Tuesday. About 4.30, news leaked around. The unbelievable had happened. Mr Whittaker had been appointed. Great excitement and a very popular choice. It's like the beginning of a new reign. We all wonder what it will mean. We feel it will bring changes. Home, feeling very excited about the news. People looked with interest to what he was going to do, and he didn't lose any time about satisfying their curiosity. The, the department became a bit of a buzz pot. You felt that having got there, having been amongst the first generation of well-educated young Irish men in the civil service, and having got to the top so quickly, that you owed something to the country. You know, there was a very strong feeling of a sense of public service. I think when he became secretary, he was very much um, a man of destiny, really, I think. And I think, he, I think he's somebody who has had this sense himself. And I think he wanted to uh, fulfill that. Whitaker broadened the horizons of the department. He chaired an interdepartmental committee looking into possible membership of the international trade organizations and the World Bank. As part of the process, a World Bank delegation came to Dublin to assess Ireland's readiness to involve itself in international trade. They paid a courtesy call on the then Taoiseach, Eamon de Valera. He gave them a version of his ideal for the country, very like that famous St. Patrick's Day speech, you know. The economic aim is to make the country as self-sufficing as is reasonably possible. And the International Monetary Fund head of mission said to me in the corridor outside, strange man, your prime minister, you <laughs> see? Uh, they could not understand that sort of, um, you know, primitive philosophy. It was 1957. Whitaker took an initiative. The thing that I think personally triggered Ken Whitaker's action in this case was a cartoon on the front of Dublin Opinion, in which there was a, a woman consulting a fortune teller who was looking into a crystal ball. And the question was, has Ireland a future? And Ken, being the man he is, he actually used this as the first paragraph of a memorandum which he sent to the Minister for Finance, Jim Ryan, and was circulated to other ministers. We were all so despondent that unless we did something like that, uh, we would almost gone out of business. This was the genesis of what would prove to be one of the most significant publications in 20th century Ireland. In a memo, he called for brainstorming from a group of younger civil servants. My mental picture of it is a, is a fool's cap page of, of single-space writing, which he told the assistant secretaries that he wanted to set up a small committee in the department, and I was nominated to be given this task. Seven civil servants worked on the project. Whitaker would read and review and circulate drafts, asking for observations. Good ideas were included quickly, without any fuss. That was Whitaker's style. I remember one of my colleagues came up with the idea of encouraging fish farms which I think is part of the programme, and so on with the different aspects. Everybody had a look at whatever they were doing, and the idea was to be positive, to think creatively. I hesitate to use corny or like honoured or whatever, you know, but we felt chuffed, as the, the best word to put it. We usually met after the office had closed for the day. Very few finance men went home at five o'clock in those days. It was the spirit of the department. I knew that I had colleagues who would be extremely interested and willing to help. I, I didn't fear the job, in fact I relished having the chance to do something uh, to 
save the country from going down the drain. The introduction to the report, outlining the overall approach, was written by Whitaker himself. It was revolutionary and heresy to the old school. Whatever the merits of self-sufficiency as a national policy for former times, wrote Whitaker, it was no longer suited to the Ireland of the late 1950s. Protection would have to go and the challenge of free trade accepted. In another break with precedent, economic development was published under Ken Whitaker's name. It wasn't a white paper, it wasn't a green paper. It became known as the grey paper. You had, in some sense, an objective, non-political document. It was emanating from the civil service, and uh, I think it helped the old Fianna Fáil to be transformed economically into the newer Fianna Fáil. They could say we're taking the advice of unbiased civil servants, and they got away with it. There wasn't a debate on this change of policy. The government prepared a bill in parallel with economic development. 1958 to 1963 program for economic expansion. It was always referred to as a program, never as a plan. You must remember that it was only in the early 1950s that planning in democracies became acceptable. Before that it had been associated with rigid um, communist regulation of economies. They did keep saying it wasn't a plan at the time, <laughs> whether that was to, to, to counter any thoughts on that line. But uh, they never pretended it was a plan, you know, this is a road we must follow type of thing, you know. The policies of the 30s, the Fianna Fáil policies of the 30s, self-sufficiency, protectionism, in effect they are torn up, which was a courageous thing for Lamas to do personally, because as Minister for Industry and Commerce at the time, he'd been most closely associated with those policies. But he was intellectually persuaded largely by Whitaker, that those policies had failed dismally. It was, I think, John Fitzgerald Kennedy who said that the role of the expert was to examine a problem to a conclusion. Nobody could as effectively got rid of protection as the very architect of it himself, Le Mas. The function of the minister, the function of the government, is to take the decision. He often said that not to make a decision was the worst decision of all. The year after the first programme for economic expansion had been launched, Eamon de Valera retired to the presidency, and Sean Lamas became Taoiseach. Dave said to me when he was leaving that, that a breath of fresh air will go through the country now with Sean Lamas. He wanted industry in the country, he wanted jobs for people. And the economy soon changed gear. Foreign investors were offered tax breaks to encourage industrial jobs in Ireland. Export of manufactured goods was actively supported. Economic growth had been stagnant at 1%, the target set was 2%, the achievement 4%. It was almost like an economic and psychological Viagra in the economy. The biggest factor of production working for us was the psychological factor. Of course, as you make progress, people expect them to keep on the higher rate of growth. Progress in modern Ireland is seen most clearly in the 1960s was a decade of change, the coming of television, Vatican II, and the program for economic expansion brought a new prosperity to the country. There was something of a generational change in politics and the civil service. And among the youngest was Ken Whitaker, as Secretary of Finance, the leader of the civil service. He won the respect of all political parties and of the interest groups we now call the social partners. Ken Whitaker addressed uh, two major trade union conferences in 1962 and in 1963. I was industrial officer of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions at that time. And in both of those speeches, the first time now that a secretary of the Department of Finance was really coming out from the closet of the department itself and talking to trade union people, he spoke about the necessity for a national incomes policy. Now, he dealt with rather difficult economic uh, issues and uh, in what I would call Department of Finance speak, but he won their confidence and he offered effectively, on behalf of the financial establishment of the state, the opportunity to trade unions, employers, and he representing the government in effect to become involved in 
the embryonic tripartite discussions on wage levels and on social policy. Ken Whitaker was an intimidating person to work with in some ways. He was so good, so much on top of the job. But having said that, provided you knew your work, uh, he was very appreciative of it. Now, if he didn't know your work, perhaps he could be a little impatient because he was a man in a hurry who wanted to get things done. There was a feeling, I thought at the time, that his dominance tended to overshadow other senior people in the department. Once we turned our minds towards free trade, we were anxious to get into some organisation, particularly one which would have agricultural support. The six would have been the ideal place to be. Ken Whitaker's prominence and expertise made him Lamas's ideal choice to lead the negotiations in Ireland's attempt to join the EEC in the early 1960s. Lamas did not look to the Department of Foreign Affairs. Joining the EEC was to be a cornerstone of Lamas's policy to increase economic growth. The advantage of being inside the free trade zone of the then six members was clear. But with the Republic's economy still closely tied to Britain, it was obvious that the fate of the Irish application depended on whether Britain was successful. The meeting of the Common Market Commission in Brussels is in the nature of a wake. Five of the member nations welcome British participation, but France and de Gaulle turned thumbs down. Ireland declined what was proffered, associate membership. Le Mans was privately disappointed, even angry. Then uh, he decided that uh, he should negotiate himself for ERA's membership of the Common Market. And he seemed to me to be quite determined to take any action which was necessary. Whitaker was sent on a tour of European capitals with different ministers again canvassing support for EEC membership. Ending protectionism, opening Ireland up to free trade, was dogma to Le Mans. He began to consider whether there was any way in which the trade between Ireland and Britain could be increased without our being inside the common market. If the Republic's economy was to seek a more balanced relationship with Britain, then it seems logical to both Lamas and Whitaker that greater trade across the Irish border, trade with Northern Ireland, should be encouraged. Despite some cross-border cooperation on practical issues, politically there had been a North-South Cold War since partition had first been enacted. The leaders of government North and South had never met in 40 years. Bad weather stopped many people going to the polls. The 1960s saw a change of leadership north of the border. The new Prime Minister, Captain Terence O'Neill, when he had been finance minister, had struck up what proved to be a fortuitous friendship at international meetings with Ken Whitaker. 1958, for the first time ever, a Northern Ireland finance minister was invited to join the British delegation at the annual meeting of the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, and that was held in, uh, in Delhi in India. What the World Bank meetings represented was a kind of wonderful clearing house of contacts. And it was there that O'Neill knocked into Ken Whitaker for the first time. Captain O'Neill had no experience of such occasions. The World Bank's vice president was Sir William Eilif, a Tyrone man. And he invited Ken Whitaker, by now a veteran of such negotiations, to show Captain O'Neill the ropes. I established a very good friendship with him. And we had many talks down those years about Ireland and the future. He obviously was a great admirer of Le Mans and I think wanted to create in his smaller domain the same kind of progressive, successful economy. He must have judged from what he was hearing from me that an invitation, if ever he sent one, would not come amiss. But I didn't prompt it. The initiative was his. All I did was facilitate it. O'Neill sent his private secretary, Jim Malley, to Dublin to meet Whitaker. They lunched at the Shelburne. Malley explained the proposal. Whitaker brought Malley here to the National Gallery of Ireland and suggested that he take a tour of the gallery while Whitaker went next door to explain the historic proposal to Le Mans. Instinctively, Le Mans said yes. North and south, the meeting was organised with the utmost secrecy. Henry was the name of the guard who was driving him from Scurries. And um, Henry hadn't been told anything about where we were going. So when uh, I got into the car, uh, Le Mans took the pipe out of his mouth and said, Henry, Belfast. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> Belfast. Poor Henry didn't think he had enough petrol to get that far. 
I remember the whole day uh, very vividly in Stroach on the Mass, who I'd certainly never met before, and uh, Kent Whitaker. I can remember in this very room, Sean Lamass and Terence O'Neill discussing the question of which of them was likely to get into more trouble as a result of this initiative. Because, of course, there were going to be people in the South who said, why are you going to that demonic place, Stormont, and uh, giving any credibility to this puppet regime in the North? Just as there were people here who would say, well, blow me, haven't you thrown away what has been a dogmatic uh, position of high principle in our party for decades? And I must say, it was an extraordinarily relaxed occasion in many ways. I can remember some amusing things he said that day, because O'Neill said, uh, you know, what do you think of Alec Douglas Hume? And he said in this marvellous way, he said, sometimes I have reservations about the innate capacity of the 14th Earl, he said. <laughs> I mean, Ken was his affable diplomatic self, but he stayed, as indeed all the officials did, somewhat in the background. Typically, Le Mans did bring an agenda for the meeting. The abolition of barriers to tourism, educational exchanges, cooperation on sharing health facilities, joint agricultural research, energy issues. Matters essentially of functional cooperation where there were benefits to both sides. In Dublin, three weeks later, Captain O'Neill met Mr. Le Mans a second time. Again, the subject of economic cooperation. There's a phrase sometimes he used about politicians, Lloyd George used it that certain politicians, preeminently important, successful politicians, they make the weather, they make the climate. And I think Whitaker, most unusually for Sybil Stone, was sufficiently influential, sufficiently knowledgeable about how the system worked, sufficiently able and also sufficiently shrewd to make the weather. And I think he created the climate in which the mass was prepared to be courageous in December, Mr. Lamas made another momentous journey, this time to London for the signing of the Anglo-Irish Free Trade Agreement. The Free Trade Early Agreement with Britain started a process of dismantling of tariffs, which was very useful in setting industry generally on that course, so they were prepared for a transition in the EEC. Captain O'Neill, he sticks up, he sticks up more for something the Catholics than he does for us in this town, in my opinion. Why do you think that? Certain things he does. Like what? Like, like talking to Lamas. You think talking to Lamas like, is a bad thing? Like yes. Like letting them fly the tricolour in the Falls Road. Letting them fly the tricolour in the Falls Road. Letting them walk on the commemorating the 1916 raising. The very year after Lamas met O'Neill in Stormont, we had the Golden Jubilee of 1916, which was undoubtedly celebrated with more enthusiasm in Belfast than it was in Dublin. And this encouraged the extremists to come out against the move towards reconciliation. The Ulster Volunteer Force was the latest body thrown up by the extremism of Ian Paisley. And I think the spirit of optimism doesn't really survive that. And I think when Lynch comes in as Thishock in 1966, um, he isn't, there, there isn't a sense of continuing breakthrough. And also, I think, O'Neill is becoming increasingly beleaguered. Once any kind of revolution is on the way, it's terribly hard to manage it. And the sluice gates come up and then the torrent goes through. And that happened with the human rights aspect of that too. Irishmen and women of goodwill have learned of the tragic events which have been taking place in Derry and elsewhere in the north. It is clear also that the Irish government can no longer stand by and see innocent people injured and perhaps worse. And that the most dramatic episode, I think, is when Whitaker is on holiday in Karna on, in August 69 and when a guard taps on the window of his house at breakfast and there he says will you ring the Taoiseach come to the barracks and ring the Taoiseach I think it was the first time ever that Karna rang the Taoiseach <laughs> and uh, spoke to me told me what was the crisis and um, I managed to urge calm and nothing threatening not to have things on the border and so on it's also an indication of how utterly ill-prepared 
the Irish state was to deal with the eruption of the Northern Ireland crisis in 1968-69. There wasn't a single official in the Department of External Affairs working on Northern Ireland. There wasn't a single official in the Department of the Teacher. The balloon has gone up in Belfast and Derry. Catholics have been burnt out of their houses. And all the Lynch can find to do is try to get hold of Ken Whitaker, who's in the wilds of Connemara. Ken Whitaker's modestly titled Note on North-South Policy, prepared for Lynch in late 1968, revealed his essential analysis of the North. He recognised that any resort to force would prove counterproductive, and he advised Jack Lynch to pursue only one option, a policy of seeking unity in Ireland by agreement in Ireland between Irishmen. It would necessarily be a long-term policy requiring patience, understanding, forbearance. All kinds of possibilities should be explored. And he warned that any return to violence risked creating a deeper and more real partition than has ever existed in the past. Whitaker's thinking in this document anticipated much of what's in the Good Friday Agreement of 30 years later. When he wrote it in 1968, the death toll in the North was nil. 1969-70 were turbulent years in the North and difficult times for Jack Lynch as Taoiseach and as Fianna Fáil party leader. Any decisions that will be taken will be taken within the party in a de democratic way and affecting the country will be taken also according to the democratic process. We got on very well and I admired him and he was a very reasonable man. He wasn't imbued with old-fashioned ideas, you know, he was a modern taking things as they came and judging them. Lynch was very comfortable with Whitaker. They got to know each other well when Lynch had been Minister for Finance. And when Whitaker went to the Central Bank, the Governor of the Central Bank, I think it was the 1st of March 1969, he was charged with the task of continuing informally to advise on Northern Ireland. And he sent at that period some, for example, uh, very strong pointed letters to Charles Hohey as Minister of Finance, urging him to adopt a more moderate policy in regard to Northern Ireland. You know, I remember him asking me one time to soften something I was saying, you know. Now, I don't know whether he came from Jack or not, but, I mean, I got... The, you know, he came here, he knew me well enough to say that, you know, to go easy on that. I did um, act as a kind of personal ambassador for Jack Lynch in some context then and um, but I think I'd better wait till it comes out in the records, the 30 years rule and expose it. One example is a secret report to Jack Lynch on a meeting in 1971 with Jim Callaghan, Britain's shadow home secretary at that time, later Labour Prime Minister. Northern Ireland was an artificial entity, argued Whitaker where Unionist Party rule was nearer to totalitarianism than genuine democracy. It would be essential to replace majority rule with representative rule. The unification of Ireland was mentioned as an ultimate objective to be reached by agreement based on consent. My view always was that it was too, too superficial to say the British just through Lloyd George inflicted partition on us, that its roots went much deeper that unless we understood the roots of it, we would never come to be able to deal with it. Ken Whitaker had retired from the secretaryship of the Department of Finance at 53, but his signature remained on the Irish banknotes. This time he signed wearing his new hat as governor of the central bank. In that role, he was regularly critical of government overspending. I can't see once expenditure levels are determined, it's not easy to cut them without causing unemployment or other adverse factors. After I retired, which I did at 60, the last thing I want is really dreary contentment. I'd like to be active. Ken Whitaker was elected Chancellor of the National University of Ireland in 1976. Eamon de Valera was Chancellor of the National University of Ireland. Garrett Fitzgerald is at present the Chancellor of the National University of Ireland. The only other Chancellor has been Ken Whitaker. And he brought to that task the same kind of strong leadership that he brought to all his other roles. In order to give the people in this country the opportunity... Following his landslide win in the 1977 general election, Jack Lynch appointed Ken Whitaker to the Senate. 
He was reappointed by Gareth Fitzgerald in 1981. I enjoyed the transition from sitting uh, like a little mouse in the corner, passing scribbled notes furtively to the minister and hearing them mangled, <laughs> <laughs> um, to be able to stand up on one's own and say one's say. It was very refreshing and I enjoyed it. You remember in 1982, he made a savage critique of government borrowing. He called it a, a scandal. He said it was utterly irresponsible, and he spoke before the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which certainly didn't endear him to the government of the day. Ken Whitaker was not reappointed to the Senate by Charles Hohey when he became Taoiseach in 1982. He was chairman of Board Nagelga, reflecting a lifetime's interest and commitment to the Irish language. He was chair of the National Industrial and Economic Council, president of the ESRI, chair of the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, president of the Royal Irish Academy, joint chair, Anglo-Irish Encounter, chair of the Agency for Personal Services Overseas, chair, and here he was especially expert, of the Salmon Research Trust. The special committee set up by the government... And in his 80th year, year, he chaired another commission, reviewing the 1937 constitution. You'd go into a meeting and who would be sitting there waiting, wonderfully well prepared, having read all the documentation. He would have a sense of, you know, where can we bring this forward or what can be done? And I think that's a great, I think it's a great mental outlook to have in life in general, to, to look for uh, where uh, progressive steps can be taken as distinct from, in some sense, regretting that we're not starting from a different place. And the report was there a year later in May 1996. Well, I have always found it a very satisfying um, thing to be able to give public service. And I, I still think it rates, should rate very highly with young people in particular, to be able to serve their country and serve those who need help. And particularly now that so many more are educated to third level, that I think they should feel some little responsibility towards the uh, less fortunate. A couple of years ago, I was marking examination scripts and there was a question about economic development. And, and this particular candidate, Big Anne, by pic, pic, painting this harrowing picture of Ireland in the 1950s, gloom, doom, emigration, unemployment. And then came along the man on a white horse, and that was T.K. Whitaker. And I think that's probably the way he's going to go down. got used to being on my own, not lonely, I still have many friends and um, very close to the family and there are people who still seem to like me so I'm enjoying life. <laughs> 